All right, guys, welcome to Daily Life in the 1930s. This is Mr. Schauber, and if you watch the Daily Life in the 1920s, you know that the 20s was just jam-packed full of interesting things, uh, cool aspects from, it was the jazz age, it was radio, it was uh, the, the bigger-than-life personalities and heroes, you know, and it was uh, mobsters and prohibition, it was the flappers, it, you know, it, it was a consumer economy, everything was, you know, things were booming. Now, most people lived a lot better in the 20s than they previously had. Not everybody. But in the 1930s, uh, this decade is marked by the Great Depression. And the Depression will pretty much go the whole decade of the 30s. It starts at the very, very end of the 20s and goes really until, pretty much, until Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. So the Depression is going to define the 1930s. Most people, of course, were uh, were affected negatively by the Great Depression. Uh, not everybody was dirt poor, but a lot of people lost jobs and, and were forced out of their homes and, and farms. And, and it, it definitely changed the way most people lived in one way or another. But uh, let's look at some of these groups then. Number one, uh, this goes with your study guide. So number one, how did the depression affect daily life for the following groups? Well, first, poor white farmers. Uh, they were hit really hard by the by the depression because people on average, the average consumer, had less money to spend on things. And so therefore, prices went down. Um, if companies or you know supermarkets or whoever wanted to sell their products, they had to lower the prices. And so because the prices are lower for the consumer to buy in the store, uh, the farmers weren't able to sell their stuff for as much money as they were used to. So prices for fruits and vegetables and uh, meat and things like that went down. And so farmers weren't making as much money, right? And so a lot of them lost their homes. They lost their farmland because uh, they couldn't make mortgage payments, couldn't make land payments. And so this was a, a rough time. I mean, this is like insult to injury, right? I mean, in a time when People have lost jobs nationwide, and people people's lives are, are affected. You don't need farmers losing their land and um, getting kicked out of their farmhouses because now who's going to grow the food, right? So, a lot of the farmers look to move west and uh, you know try their hand at either you know working on uh, other people's farms or you know just trying to do something to, to scrape by. Now, among wealthy whites. Um, unemployment went up, homelessness went up, uh, Hoovervilles, the shanty towns, uh, pop up. Uh, some of these people are forced to go on the bread lines uh, to, to basically, you know, get bread and soup uh, from the bread, the bread uh, uh, or soup kitchens. You know, you basically would go and stand in line and try to basically get a handout for a little bit of food and some soup, you know, type thing. But you know, the ultra wealthy. You know, of course, we're not nearly as effective. They still had money, and they still, you know, they were doing fine. In fact, if you were, if you had cash on hand during the Great Depression, you were probably living as well or better in the 30s as you were in the 20s because uh, prices had gone down on most things. So if you had cash, your buying power was greater. But for a lot of people who had been bankers, who had been, uh, you name it, right, doctors, lawyers, people who had made a pretty good living in the 20s, some of these people were hit really hard by the Depression. And actually, you know, lost their homes and were on the breadline. So uh, this was a reality for some people, right? What about African Americans? Well, unfortunately for minorities, it was pretty tough. African Americans faced a lot of discrimination. Often the first ones fired and the last ones hired uh, at, at jobs. A lot of them migrated from the South to the North, just like in the 20s. Okay, another great migration. But for, like I said, for African Americans, it was tough, uh, like it was for a lot of people. But but if you're a minority, you were targeted. And oftentimes, you know, people look to others to blame for, you know, their own problems or when things go bad. So, you know, you blame minority groups who have a harder time defending themselves, you know, based on sheer numbers. And so, uh African-Americans found it hard, hard sledding and, and then Hispanic Americans as well. A lot of them had been brought in as uh, farm workers and factory workers in World War One. <clears throat> now there's no jobs. Right. 
and so they face unemployment discrimination as well. And uh, so it, it was a tough time. It's called the Great Depression. It was very depressing. It was a tough time for people. Uh, it definitely shaped and molded a mentality in people that most of them would never, uh, never be able to really shake. They'd never be able to get rid of. They kept that mentality. A lot of these people kept their, that mentality their entire life. All right. Uh, the second question, what were prices like during the Depression? Well, prices were generally down, as I mentioned in the last slide. You can see, and can you just uh, wish that the prices of things today were the same as you see on the uh, on this slide? Sirloin steak, 29 cents a pound. Chicken, 22 cents a pound. Bread's 5 cents a loaf. Potatoes, 2 cents a pound, right? Uh, you know, so things were a lot cheaper because, you know, obviously people made less money and, you know, we've you know, obviously prices go up as time and history advances, right? So, uh, but it, prices were down, so farmers were hit hard, and, you know, people were just trying to eke out a living and scrape by, and uh, pretty darn hard. Um, you know, supplies are up, uh, you know, at times, and, 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 um, and especially for the, the, the big ticket items. You know, if places still uh, were producing some big ticket items, but demand is down because people don't have the money to, to, to buy them, then it's pretty tough. So prices have to drop naturally. All right, so let's look at fashion uh, during the 1930s. Men's fashion first. Uh, very conservative, very more traditional, kind of like it had been in the 20s. I mean, the 20s was still traditional for men. Women's fashions seem to change more and more radically than men's anyway. But uh, in the 1930s, men had pants with cuffs at the bottom and uh, wider ties and pleated pants. The pleated pants are, are shown on the far right there. They're the up, up near the waistline. They have the lines going down the creases. Okay, that's those are pleats. Uh, Wingtip shoes. Sweater vests became popular. Of course, hats were still in. And this, I mean, it wasn't a huge change from the 20s. You still tried to dress up when you went outside and, you know, but obviously if people have less money to buy on things uh, or to spend on things, excuse me, then, then you know, fashion is going to reflect that as well. So that's men's fashion in general. Now for women, this is a big change for some women in the, in the 30s. Uh, because a lot of a lot of it went back to a more conservative uh, style. Uh, basically, the, they would kind of say like the hemline, as far as your uh, the material goes down. Okay, uh, the hemline followed the stock market. It was up in the 20s and way down in the 30s for women. So dresses got longer again, uh, and the hair got longer, and sleeves got longer. There's less skin showing, right? And so, you know, this was it. it Kind of we went back to a more conservative style of clothing and and look and so uh, that was you know women's fashions definitely changed more than men's especially for the flappers of the 20s versus the 30s right all right next question what were some of the things that children did for fun in the 1930s well because uh, there's less money to go around you have to be more creative in your in your your play okay and so board games became very popular Ironic that Monopoly, where you're trying to get rich, right, comes out in the Great Depression, but um, maybe not so ironic. But Scrabble, um, you know, became a thing. Uh, crossword puzzles were, a, were cheap entertainment. So was stickball in the streets, right? Uh, hopscotch, bingo. You know, kids invent their own fun, right? And so when the family has less money to spend on things, you come up with more creative things to occupy your time. And, of course, uh, Monopoly, Scrabble, they're still around today. Crossword puzzles still around today. Bingo, you know. I mean, we still do all these things today, but you have to, uh, you just have to be a little innovative, right? And that's what kids were in the 1930s. Of course, marbles continue and things like that that had happened in the 20s, but some of the uh, the the cool toys, so to speak, that had come around in the 20s, those are kind of out in the 30s. Next question, what was school like in the 1930s? Well, school was interesting because um, there was a loss of revenue 
because uh, people had less money. So there's not as much tax money collected by the government to go to, to education. And so, you know, you had teacher salaries cut. You had some teachers lose jobs. You had kids come into school hungry. There weren't enough materials to go around. Uh, kids didn't have the sufficient materials that we would consider sufficient anyway for school. Uh, Dick and Jane books came out and to help kids learn how to read. This was kind of like their first readers, you know, and so you had things, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys under, know what these books are, but I bet your parents and certainly your grandparents would have known. Uh, Jane, Jane said, Dick, come and play. I want to play something. Will you play? Jane said, I will play. You know, it, it te ba very basic teaching kids uh, how to read. OK, so these kind of became famous during this time. But uh, it was it man, it was uh, it was a tough time for education, no doubt. OK. Next question, what was dating like in the 1930s? Well, the purpose of dating changed. Uh, before the 1930s, the purpose of dating really was to find a spouse. Uh, and now in the 30s, it's more about having fun. Uh, it's less formal, okay? You could date more than one person. You could go out with one person one weekend and another person another weekend. And, you know, before that, it was kind of, you know, you started dating somebody and it was expected that you were kind of going steady and you would date only that person. Uh you know, people weren't making as many formal commitments, right? More hanging out in the 1930s than before. Uh, it was expected that the man would pay for dates, but of course there's not as much money to go around, so you would do things that were less expensive, right? Um, today, movies are kind of pricey, I think, but movies were cheap back then. The 1930s, as we will see, is kind of the golden age of Hollywood, and movies are cheap. And so a lot of dancing, a lot of movies for dates, a lot of group dates, uh, you know, less maybe one-on-one, -on -one, you know, more group dates. So it was uh, definitely, it, it, to me, the 1930s dating is more similar to kind of how it is now, today. Uh, but anyway, that's what kind of defines, you know, the dating scene in the 30s. All right, next question. Uh, what were some of the trends in popular music during the 1930s? Well, it was kind of a continuation of jazz and blues from the 1920s. Music didn't change as drastically as some other aspects of society did uh, in the 30s. And, of course, there was widespread uh, radio ownership among the U.S. population still, so people got their music fix on the radio. Uh, but you did have things like big bands kind of come into being as well. Big bands are what they sound like uh, they are. They are a lot of members. They're 10, 12, 15 members sometimes. They're all playing different instruments and... and uh, you get quite a sound out of the big band. Uh, Benny Goodman there, uh, the, the center top picture, uh, was was the head of a, a big band, a famous big band. Of course, Duke Ellington stayed on the scene there. There's a picture of him. George Gershwin comes onto the scene as well. And you have Broadway musicals uh, that, uh, that will come around in the 30s. Of course, Broadway musicals are still extremely popular today. The Jitterbug was kind of a famous dance that emerges in the 30s, and um, the Star Spangled Banner officially becomes the national anthem in 1931, and, uh, you know, it's just, the 30s was, obviously, the music in any generation kind of reflects the attitude that people have during that generation and what's going on in the country and, and the mood of the country, and, you know, so the 30s music was a lot of times about uh, Great Depression themes and and about hard times and so forth. But, um, you know, some people try to, you, you would try to get away from your troubles for a couple hours and go dancing or go to the movies. You try to get away from your troubles and go to a baseball game or, you know, entertainment somehow, uh, if you could afford it. And, you know, that's how you forgot about your problems for a while. So, but music in the 30s was fantastic, just like it had been in the 20s and, and jazz and blues, you know, still popular today. Next question, how did movies change during the 1930s? Well, the demand for movies is way up because people are looking, like I said, to forget their, their troubles for a while. This is known as Hollywood's golden age. Uh, there were so many movies produced, uh, way more than are produced uh, today. Uh, this is the time of the first color movies that, that come out. 
and not every movie will be color, but the, the first color movies start uh, during this time. You also have uh, the Academy Awards that start. So you're giving awards to actors and actresses and directors and so forth uh, for, for their, their uh, work in the movies. Uh, this is big name stars, right? You have Shirley Temple, who actually was probably the biggest star of all of the 1930s. She's just a little girl. Um, she she was she captured you know everybody's heart right worldwide. She was famous, and uh, she starred in some big movies and just I mean was bigger than life you know on on the on the silver screen. Uh, Clark Gable was kind of the headliner as far as male actors went, and Betty Davis was one of the headliners for female actresses. And um, you know, it's it was just a time when people you, you saw a lot of movies. That's just what you did. Um, it's also a time that Disney uh, really starts doing their full-length movies. Let's look at that. Disney's first full-length show was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in 1937. And uh, The Gone with the Wind came out, which is one of the most famous movies of all time. And The Wizard of Oz came out as a full-length uh, movie. And uh, obviously, color the color technology kind of came around when they were when they were filming that movie. So these are all three uh, still very loved and watched movies today, you know, classics. Uh, and of course, these are only a few of the movies of the 30s, but these are some of the most popular. So it just, it was a time when movies, Hollywood was kind of king uh, in American life. The next question asks, what were some of the trends or fads of the 1930s? Well, you had all kinds of stuff, and a lot of times, again, cheap entertainment, but stamp collecting, board games, if you could afford them, uh, the Betty Boop character, okay, miniature golf became a big deal, you know, it's a lot cheaper than than full-length golf type, uh, type stuff, so um, it was great for dates and great for just, you know, to get away for a little while. Uh, the Zoot Suit, which is the bottom left there, kind of the gangster-looking suit with the long tails on the coat, you know, that became, for those that could afford it, that was a cool fad, you know, and of course, baseball. Baseball, I don't know if it became our national pastime in the 30s, but that it was the national pastime was reinforced in the 30s. And baseball is not really the national pastime, you know, as far as the most popular sport anymore. But for most of American history, it was. And, uh, you know, since it's been invented. And, and uh, so baseball was a big deal, especially, you know, the if if you could afford to go to a game, and a lot of times it costs you 10 cents, you know, or 25 cents to go to a baseball game. Now, that went farther than it does today, but still nothing like, you know, you go to a ball game today, uh, it's not uncommon to, to spend 40, 45, 50 bucks uh, at a major league game for a seat that's not even that great. So times have changed, no doubt about it, but uh, these are some of the trends and fads of the 1930s that people did to, you know, again, escape their problems for a while and focus on something else and, and entertain themselves. Next question, what were some of the new slang terms of the 30s? Well, it's hard to top the 20s slang. The 1920s slang was fantastic, but the 30s, yeah, a little more dialed down, toned down, a little, little, uh, a little less crazy, but you had Hoovervilles, of course, that was a slam on uh, Herbert Hoover. Uh, and those were the kind of the makeshift shanty towns, you know, outside of town that people lost their homes. They, you know, build these makeshift dwellings out of cardboard and, you know, uh, scrap metal and whatever they could, whatever they could get, you know. On the bread line meant that you, had, you were out of work. You were going to soup kitchens for food, okay. To take someone for a ride, that was kind of a mafia term to kill them, right. Uh, put someone on the spot, make someone uncomfortable. We still use that today. I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you answer this question for me? Type thing, you know. Uh, give someone the works, the full treatment. And that was usually a good thing, right? You're giving them, you know, you're treating them well. You're giving them, uh, you're giving them, you know, everything they could ask for and more, right? And a stool pigeon. This is one of my favorites. This is an informant. You had a lot of guys out of work. They were just sitting around shooting the bull during the day. They're out on the sidewalk. And so, you know, you you need information, you, you know, you go up to them, hey, where's this at? Well, they, they got time to tell you. It could also be an informant as far as, uh, you know, the FBI was concerned or, you know, someone uh, ratting out the mob or you know, it could be that too, but, but uh, stool pigeon was a classic. So these are some of the 
new slang, right, that comes around in the 30s. Every decade has its slang, and uh, the 30s is no exception. And finally, what were some of the innovations of the 1930s? Things that kind of became new and, uh, you know, became part of society. Well, it, it kind of interesting, zippers, the use of zippers, they're less expensive than buttons, so zipper use is way up, okay? And uh, of course, most things have zippers, you know, as far as pants and stuff today, still have zippers. Uh, drive-in movies, super popular in the 1930s. Not only would you go to the movie theater, but you could go to the drive-in, you know, on a nice summer night, and you go and watch the movie. Uh, the World's Fair, which used to be a really big deal. Uh, every number of years, they would they would pick a different location around the world and have the World's Fair, which was kind of like, it was to show off uh, the, the new technology and some of the new innovations that people had come up with, you know, uh, since the last World's Fair. And kind of a look at the future, if you will, for the technology that would be out there. Uh, they're not, they're, the World's Fair is not really a big deal anymore, but it used to be a really big deal when, uh, you know, when I guess there was less going, right? Uh, the board game Monopoly stayed really popular, okay, and was an innovation. The planet Pluto was discovered, okay? I, I guess our, uh, our uh, you know, technology in uh, telescopes and, and things like that, you know, our astronomy uh, improved. So uh, Pluto's discovered. The first copy machine is created. Now, it's nothing like the copy machines today, which are super expensive, you know, the big ones, and really can do amazing things. But the first copy machine, I mean, think about the implications of that. Think about the implications of a copy machine to be able to quickly copy what's on a paper instead of having to hand write the, the information over again. You know, and, and I mean, talk about, I mean, these are, you know, big deals, right? Um, things like uh, nylon and cellophane are created. And think of all the uses those would have uh, later on and even up to our present day. So there's some, some big stuff, some really far reaching and important innovations made in the 30s. But by and large, it was a time when, uh, you know, most people are just trying to get by and just trying to make it uh, in the world and, you know, trying to have enough to eat, you know, for that day. And so you, you had a little bit less uh, going on as far as the technology and innovations compared to some other times. So anyway, but that's kind of your daily life, your, your popular culture in the 30s. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And, you know, even though it was the Great Depression, there was still stuff going on. People still had to live their lives. And, and you know, most people, I mean, the majority still had jobs. And, uh, you know, but you know, a lot of people lost their jobs and uh, as well, and had to rely on the the charity of family and friends to survive. And and you know, and but but people did help each other out more back then too. And that's something that can be said about the 30s is that people relied on others more, and a lot of people came through. You know, and today I don't know that even though we're much as far as economically we're much better off than they were in the 1930s. We're uh, I don't know that people help each other as much and are as friendly, you know. So anyway, uh, interesting times, no doubt about it. And there's your 1930s.